Hello again and welcome to Marine Biology. I thank you guys so much for showing up every single week. I know this is not easy. Again, I say this all the time, but it's true because it's really not easy. Um, so thanks for keeping up with me and my videos and I really hope that they are helping you guys out. So without further ado, you guys know the drill. We're just going to go ahead and get right into it. Let's talk about a bunch of different phylums today. So we're going to be talking about some of the smaller phylums. So when we come to phylums like Mollusca or Arthropoda, those are really big phylums. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about those. Some of these other lesser phylums are a little bit smaller and, and therefore a little bit simpler, especially when it comes to the taxonomy wise. And therefore we're not going to spend a whole ton of time on them. Now, yes, you do need, still need to know every single one of them. You need to know any taxonomy that I give you, characteristics, you know, defining qualities that make this phylum different than this phylum. All of these things are very, very important. Um, but we're actually going to blow through four phylums today in this video. And you're like, what? That's so many. Trust me, it's actually, it's not. We're going to be going through them pretty quickly. First off, we're going to be talking about the phylum Ketanatha. Now, I do pronounce it with a k sound. That's because that CH does make a k sound. So it's not Chetanatha, right? It's Ketanatha. Um, then we're going to be moving on to the other worm phylums like Annelida and some of our, um, sorry, our Ketonatha. Sorry, we're starting out with Tenophora. Ah! See, I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry, we're starting out with Tenophora. And just like the Cnidarians that we talked about, the C is silent. Okay, so these are going to be your comb jellies. Then we're going to be moving on to the phylum Ketonatha. Those are the bristle mouth worms or the arrow mouth worms. Um, and then we're going to be following up with Annelida and all sorts of other different worm species or phylums. So that's what we're talking about today. So before I just ramble on and just start talking nonsense, um, totally getting ahead of myself, let's just go ahead and get started. Um, phylum Tenophora. <laughs> See, I almost said Ketonatha again. All right, so Tenophores. Tenophores are really beautiful. They're amazing. They've got these like iridescent, beautiful colors that you can see at night in the deep water. It's really, really cool. However, they do look a lot like jellies. Okay, so we've already learned about Nigerians, so now we're going to learn about Tenophores, and we're going to learn about the differences between the two. Okay, I love to give you guys test questions like that. What's the difference between Tenophores and Nigerians? Because they look super similar, but they are really different. So keep, the, the, keep those things in mind as we're going along today, especially with the different worm phylums too. I could ask you, what's the difference between all the worm phylums? And if you watch this lecture and went over the notes, then you'd know. So, without further ado, don't worry about the spring 2020. That's old, obviously. We were normal in spring 2020, at least the beginning of spring 2020 when we were normal. Anyway, um, okay, so let's look at the taxonomy here. There we go. All right, so again, we are still in the domain Eukarya. We're still in the kingdom Animalia. We are now in the phylum Tenophora, okay? And there are only two classes, just like the sponges we learned about, very simple taxonomy. Uh, even the Nidarians, very simple taxonomy is going to get much harder. So don't think, oh, there's only going to be a couple. No, there's not. There's going to be a lot more when we get to especially things like phylum mollusca. It goes all the way from like simple clams to octopuses. Um, all right. So the two classes that we're going to be talking about with the Tenophores are the class Tenticulata, meaning it has two tentacles, or the class Nuda, which means it has no tentacles. Super simple, guys. Super simple taxonomy when it comes to this. Um, it comes to this phylum. So make sure that you guys are paying attention to the taxonomy as we go along. And remember, I should have a master taxonomy list for you guys, but otherwise I give it to you in each one of these lectures. You can make your own. Weird. Okay. Now, just like the jellies that we talked about, these guys are gelatinous. Okay. That's their most defining characteristics that makes them both super, super similar. Not just are they both gelatinous, they're both radial in symmetry. And you're like, Man, I thought I was going to be able to tell the difference between jellies and tenophores. Well, you still are. Because some other key characteristics in, with these guys is that one, instead of having a mouth anus, remember the mouth anus that I wouldn't stop talking about? These guys actually have a separate mouth and anus. So jellies like Cnidarians have one opening, tenophores have two. Okay, so it's a little bit more complex of a digestive system um, because they do have two openings. Yay! I know, I'd be thrilled if I had two openings. Um, another one, the reason that they're called tenophores is that they have what's called teens. So again, I'm, I'm not pronouncing the C, it's not teens, right? I'm just pronouncing the T, the C is silent, so it is considered a teen. Now, they have eight teens all over their body, and these teens essentially are just made up of cilia. So remember cilia we talked about, like the little fingers that beat in unison? So they actually have these rows called teen rows or comb rows, okay? They have eight of them, eight comb rows which are just 
Again, these little rows of cilia. Now this is what gives them their actual iridescence, which is super cool. I have a video to show you guys. Um, but if you see them in person, I know Long Beach Aquarium has an exhibit, a rotating exhibit. Um, some other aquariums have them and they kind of shut off all the lights and you can see them and their teens, their cilia as they beat, actually creates this like iridescent rainbow looking color. It's stunning. It's gorgeous. I used to go out on these field trips and we would pull up these like deep water trawl samples at night and we'd put them in a tank and we'd turn off all the lights on the boat and you could see them. They're like flashing these beautiful bioluminescent colors. They've got their rainbow teens going off. It's really cool. So if you ever get a chance to see Tina Fours, don't just walk by the exhibit and be like, oh, they're small jellies. They're not jellies. They're Tina Fours. Now, just like the jellies, again, they're radial in symmetry. They have, um, or sometimes biradial if you're talking about some of the nudas. Um, they have their gelatinous, they have, two, okay, they have two openings instead of just one openings like the Nidarians, but they are voracious predators, okay? These guys are actively swimming around using their teens and they're gobbling up anything that they can. So just like some of those jellyfish that we learned about that are really good predators, these guys are just swimming around eating things like nobody's business. Um, what else? They have, we already talked about that, um, let me look at over here. Uh, they do have a sub-epidermal nerve net. Essentially, this is kind of on its way to becoming a nervous system. Like, we have a nervous system. You can tell if there's something going on inside of us. These guys don't have a complex nerve system, but they do what's called a nerve net. So they can respond to stimuli. Again, that's another thing that makes you alive, that you're responding to stimuli. Um, tenophores are only found in the marine environment. So where some uh, other species can be freshwater or marine, these tenophores are just going to be solely marine. Um... And again, they're all carnivores. They're basically just swimming around trying to eat things like nobody's business. Oh, another big difference between the two. So cnidarians have those nematocysts, right? The cnidocytes and the nematocysts, the stinging cells that are going to shoot those little barbs out and attack you, right? These guys do not have that. Okay, so tenophores cannot sting you. You can hold them, you can poke them, you can play with them. I mean, don't. But you can, and they're not going to hurt you. So no stinging cells here. These guys are just swimming around and they've got, if you're the tentaculatus um, class, you've got tentacles that are just kind of like floating out there. And if they feel something, then they're going to pull you in and eat you. Um, so again, this is their long sticky tentacles. If you are tentaculata, if you're in the class nuda, obviously you don't have two tentacles because you're in the class nuda or no tentacles. All right, so here's a couple different pictures. Um, Hopefully you guys can see this better on your actual PowerPoints, but you know, we typically have this like round barrel-ish body form. This is going to be very characteristic of tenticulata. And what you really can see is all the tentacles coming out. So these guys, two tentacles, two tentacles, two tentacles, two tentacles, two very long, almost like spider web looking tentacles. Again, these two right here would probably be more deeper water species because if you have long tentacles that are just way out there and super thin and floating around, you can't live in an area that's high surf, right? That high surf area is going to break off your little tentacles. Now you can't feed and now you die. Okay, so not a good thing. So anytime, remember I was talking about how you can kind of look at the organism and based on its morphology, based on its features, you can kind of figure out where it lives, right? Well, these guys are transparent. Makes it great for deep water living because there's no light. They can suddenly see right through them. Um, and these long, really thin, fragile tentacles are really going to be characteristic of a deeper water species. You can't have wave action if you've got tentacles like this. Otherwise, you're just, you're not going to do well. Here's a body picture of this. Normally, I would have you guys uh, basically have a notebook and I would check it every week and you do drawings and stuff like that. So this is a classic example of a drawing that I would have put in your notebook, um, which is basically one big study guide, but we're not doing this semester like that. COVID. But um, again, this is just kind of give you an idea of like the body morphology and the actual, actual parts if you want to know them. Will I test you on them? Probably not. There's way too many phylums and way too many, you know, vocab words and parts and stuff. I can't test you on every single one of them. So if I, if I show you a diagram of it and I really talk about it, like remember when we talked about the nidocytes and you saw the video, that I could absolutely put on your exam. I'm not going to test you on every single one of these. Like the tentacular sheath, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna test you on that. But you should kind of get an idea of what's going on in each one of these diagrams. So we have the two openings, right? We have the mouth down here, and guess where, guess where his anus is? Right here, which means he poops on the top of his head. Yeah, he's a shithead technically. I know, I swore. It's okay. <laughs> I make that same joke in class. You guys are all adults. I'm sure you can, 
you hear way worse than the news than on TV. Anyway, um, so the long tentacles coming out, again, depending on the species, you're going to have the complexity of the tentacles, you know, varying. Sometimes you're going to have those big, long, webby ones. Sometimes they're just going to be shorter and thinner. Uh, it really depends on the species. Uh, these rows coming down here, these little lines, do, 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 those are the comb rows, right? Those are technically the teens. This is what makes it a teen of four. Okay, and that's what you can see right here. This is that rainbow iridescent color. Those are all the comb rows. Those are all the teens. Those are all the little cilia that are just beating. And they're creating that really, really beautiful rainbow color. Um, just gorgeous. If you ever get to see it in person, I highly recommend it. All right, moving on to the class Nuda. Remember, this is the non-tenticular one, right? So, again, this kind of barrel-like form. This is Barreau right here. This is a very common um, species that we have on our coast. But sometimes, like, the, these guys all look kind of like jellies. Like, if you ignore these right here and you look at these two, you're like, okay, they look like Tina Fours. I can see the rows. Cool. And then here's where you get to some tricky ones. So I, I always like to throw a couple of little curveballs at you guys and these exams and stuff because you do really need to be paying attention. You can't just go breeze over this and be like, I know what they look like, right? These three right here are the ribbon forms of the uh, Tina fours. So they're not the big barrel. They don't look like jellies. Like you're like, what is this? Is like a ribbon of size? Is this a worm? Like, well, I don't know what this is. Okay. It is a Tina four. Okay, in the class Nuda. So this is kind of a tricky one, but I'm, I'm telling you guys now so that you, you know, hint, hint, wink, wink. If it shows up on your exam, you can't blame me because I gave it to you guys. Um, so in this case, their, their teens or their comoros are actually going down the length of their body instead of basically wrapping around. Um, so this would be more the biradial ones as well. Uh, a little bit more, again, complicated, but as long as you guys see them, you should be fine. All right, so again, this is what the two uh, body morphologies we have. This is the Barreau species, really, really common, um, class Nuda. Looks like the barrel. He's got these comb rows coming up here. Big old mouth down at the bottom, and no tentacles, hence not in tenticulata. This is in the class Nuda. This is another one right here. This is Cestum species. Um, basically, they have the comb rows going on the outside down here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because they're radiating out each way. So remember, they always have eight comb rows. Um, so essentially the same kind of thing, just, you know, it's like someone stepped on this one, <laughs> ripped him, not ripped him apart, stretched it out. There you go. All right. Ah, here's a video that I wanted to show you guys. Um, this is a little YouTube clip that I just found. Um, you know, you, there's not a ton of really great videos on Tina Force. I looked for a good one. This one's okay. It's not like the Shape of Life videos that we've seen so far, um, but it is still really cool. So let's go ahead and take a minute and watch that. Okay, I hope you guys really enjoyed that. Um, remember, all my videos are for you guys, not for me. I already know what these things are, remember? So I do really want you to watch them. And I have provided links on your Canvas page. Um, you can also always pause this and just type in the actual um, website. <gasps> and that's it. That was the phylum Tinafora. Weird. And now we're on to the next phylum. Let's talk about some worms, guys. Moving right along, let's talk about our next phylum. Actually, our next couple phylums. So we're going to be talking about all of the different worm phylums. And so even though there are worms and you're going to be like, oh my God, are they really that different? Yes. In fact, they're very different. And that's why we're going to talk about them. So first up is the phylum platyhelminthes. These are going to be our flat worms, followed by the phylum, excuse me, analyta. These are going to be your segmented worms. And last but not least, we have the ketonatha, the arrow worms or the bristle mouth worms. Now, there are other species of worms or other phylums of worms. We're not really going to go into them too much in detail again. We have a lot of taxonomy to cover. Um, so you're going to be thinking that we're not studying actually even more worms. What? You're like, there's more worms? So many more worms. But let's just talk about these three today. All right. First off, we have the phylum platyhelminthes. And I do say it like platy because it kind of sounds like flatty, right? These are your flat worms, okay? So we're going to see... I don't think we actually talk about the round worms in this class, but we are going to be doing the segmented worms. We're going to talk about the arrow worms. These are the flat worms, okay? So again, easy test question. I could ask you, what's the differences between the worms? Um, all right, so these are going to be your flukes, your tapeworms, your turbularians, like this little guy right here. Um, there is a lot of these guys. Some are marine, some are freshwater, some are terrestrial, right? This isn't just a solely marine phylum like the Tina Fours that we just saw. 
Um, some can be free living, like this guy is a little free living planaria right here. Um, you, we used to do experiments in the lab with, the, with these guys because they have a really amazing regeneration properties. So one of our experiments was um, cut them in half, however you want to, and then two of them will then grow. It's crazy. Um, so I think we cut ours in half like this, and then there was two afterwards. Uh, I know one group cut them come like down the middle, and then he had two heads. I kind of felt bad for him because he has like two heads and nowhere to go. And probably pretty confusing for him. Um, but totally good because these guys can regenerate really, really well, actually. Um, let's see. Oh, yes. Okay, so when it comes to the worms, specifically, I think it was Annalita that came first. But we can't exactly be 100% sure about that. We now have hunters, right? Not just predators, meaning if you come near me, I get to eat you. We actually now have hunters. Okay, so these guys are going to be the first hunters. I think it's the phylum Annalita. I'm going to show you guys in the, back, in the Shape of Life video. First hunters, Annalita. Okay, so these are the flatworms. We're not getting there quite yet, but, um... These guys do have distinct heads. So this is also the first time in worms that we're actually seeing a definitive head region. Okay, before when we had the um, sponges, right, they're just kind of all amorphic. We had the cnidarians, which like had a bell and a nerve net, but not really, you know, a brain or a head. So now we're actually starting to see like neuroganglions that are in your brains. We're starting to see defined head region. We're starting to see eyes. So now we're kind of getting into a little bit more of these features that you were probably more familiar about when you think about animals, right? You don't usually think about some ribbon looking thing with a little cilia beating. You think about something with a head and eyes and, and actually being able to be a predator, okay? So that's where we're getting into now. Uh, they do have three distinct tissue layers. Again, we now have tissues, like real for sure tissues, like us tissues, we now have tissues. Okay, remember periphery didn't have tissues, these guys do. And Pretty much from here on out, except a couple different, um, you know, little minor ones that stick out, we're going to be bilateral. So pretty much all the phylums we're going to be talking about, um, except Echinodermata and some of the Mollusca, we're going to be looking at bilateral symmetry, meaning two sides. You can cut me directly in half and I'm a mirror image on both sides. Here's the flatworms, they come in a variety of different shapes and sizes and colors. Um, so again, we have a whole different variety of them. Now, it is really, really key that you distinguish the flatworms from, say, non-shelled mollusks. So this guy, I can tell you, does look a lot like what's called a nudibranch. Okay, it's not a nudibranch, but it looks like a nudibranch. Nudibranch have a couple little different um, structures that these guys don't have. So it's really key, again, to make sure that you are clear in your distinctions on who's who and what's going on in each of these phylums. And don't just look at them and be like, oh, I know what that is. You have to actually start looking at the characteristics that I'm pointing out. That's why I'm pointing them out to you guys. All right. Um, so some of the turbularians that we're going to be talking about, these guys are free living. Oh, we did talk about how some of the, well, we didn't talk about, but I meant to talk about how some of these guys in the platyhemanthes are parasitic. Okay, so some are free living, like all the worms that we just saw are free living, but some of them are parasitic. Um, yeah, those, these are the not good worms, but we're going to talk about those in a second when we get there. Um, they do have these little eye spots, these little turbularians. They're not eyes, but they are eye spots because they can kind of detect at least like colors, and, well not like colors, but um, kind of shadows. So if you see something coming, like something goes above you, maybe like a bird or something, you can go, oh, okay, that's definitely coming. And depending on the species, some of their eyes are actually better developed or not. Um, and just like we just saw, some of them are very, very beautiful with these big, bright, striking colors. All right, so these are the two little eye spots. It does look like he's kind of cross-eyed, but he's not. That's just his eye spots. Um, you go over the little, again, this is a ganglia, these sensory organs, organs that are kind of working together um, to kind of like give them, the, not the idea of a thought. That <laughs> doesn't make any sense. But we're basically, we're trying to build a complex brain, okay? So slowly but surely through evolution, we're getting smaller and smaller steps like these, these ganglia. Um, this is the pharynx right here, which on the opening is the mouth. So you might think this is his head and that's where his mouth would go, but it's actually not. His mouth is all the way down here on the belly side, the ventral side of his body, halfway down. So kind of interesting how they do that. Uh, we're, turning, we're starting to see these gastrovascular cavities. It's basically kind of like your digestive cavity or your digestive system going on. Um, so yeah, this is a turbolarian. Flukes, flukes are parasitic. Flukes are big and flat, hence flatworms. 
Uh, and they are, they are parasitic little guys, little buggers. Um, they are amazing reproducers. They can reproduce in conditions and faster than, than a lot of these other worm systems, or worm species, uh, excuse me. And therefore, tend to survive pretty well, these silly little flukes. Um, we, as vertebrates, are host to flukes, you know, all the time. Thankfully, you as people probably live in a nice, a clean area and environment and don't drink water that's been polluted with larvae of these guys because a lot of the times that's how it happens. You know, if you live in the third world countries and you don't have access to clean water sources, basically what you get is the larvae of these worm species living in the water and then you drink said water and then they get into you and that's how they become parasitic because they're just going to start feasting off of you and it's really hard to get rid of, especially without medication. It's almost impossible. Um, these guys also, their larvae, if they're not just in, say, the water, the drinking water, can actually hide out in certain types of shellfish. So the larvae, they basically their life cycle depends on parasitizing different organisms. So when they're younger, they'll do things like um, small fishes or clams or mussels or, or you know shellfish and stuff like that. Um, and then when they're when they get large enough, you know, hopefully that fish has been eaten by a person and that's how they get inside of you. So there's all sorts of different ways that they can get inside of you and, and be a parasite to you. None of them are good, right? You don't want any of them, but that's, that's how they do. Good times. Uh, they do basically drink your blood, right? They're kind of feeding off of your blood vessels and stuff like that, um, in your intestines, in your, oh, it's just all sorts of gross, guys. All sorts of gross. And here's what they look like. Like I said, they're big, they're kind of beefy, but they're super flat. So flukes are pretty easy to identify. Tapeworms. Tapeworms are another one that live inside of you and get really, really gross. In fact, they live inside lots of marine mammals. Well, and not just marine mammals, inside us too, humans sometimes. You can get a tapeworm and basically you start losing weight and you don't know why. It's because you've got a freaking tapeworm living inside of you. Super gross. Um, but I think the scariest part about the tapeworm is what's called a scolex. So a scolex, because these guys are parasitic, is basically how they hold on to you. And it basically looks like a big round mouth with these like crazy spikes that are going to go like... And just, oh, and that's exactly what they do. So I'm going to show you guys a picture of that in a second. But um, this would be, again, any kind of underlying bolded words that maybe I specifically mention and say, hey, these are the only guys who have it. It could be on your test. I don't know. Keep that in mind. Um... Let's see, they do have a cuticle around their body. This kind of allows them to naturally absorb nutrients and, and whatever else that they might need just through their skin. Now this is really unique of, of um, certain phylums and therefore allows them to live in areas that you might not be able to survive elsewhere because you might not be able to feed yourself, but they can just do simple diffusion and actually get these nutrients inside their body, which is crazy. Um, these tapeworms have no digestive system and they don't really need it because guess who did all the digesting? Right? They're just going to suck everything else out of us once we've already done all the hard work. Jerks! Right? They also live inside of you. Ugh. <laughs> Sorry. So gross. All right. Um, here's what they look like, and here's what this horrific little psycho head looks like. Again, it's just this little, this is the scolex, and it goes, and just rubs onto you, and Ugh. gross. Um, tiny, tiny little head. Again, that's basically just the only part that attaches to and then you have this long body afterwards yeah no thank you i think um off the top of my head i can't remember exactly how long it was but i want to say it was like so they're like 40 something feet or 70 something feet a tapeworm that they pulled off of like a, a whale so a whale had died and they basically went inside its intestines and they found this you're talking like four to seven stories worth of worm ah but i mean also that's like a super big male, that whale, so he's probably had a ton of food, and again, they'll just grow, and grow, and grow, and grow, and grow, and grow, no one's gonna stop them, they got lots of nutrients, they get everything they need, they're just gonna keep growing, I know, all right, getting on to the phylum Annelida, these are the segmented worms, these guys are pretty cute, they do come in a variety of different shapes and sizes and colors, like we can see right here, um, some key characteristics for these guys right off the bat is that the fact that they are segmented. Okay, so if you look at the segmentation, right, essentially you segment some of these tiny, tiny little, these are all segments. Okay, so if you look and you see a segmented worm. Now, I did just show you a picture of a segmented worm that was in Platy Helminthi, so keep that one in mind. This guy's the only weirdo in the group, but all of these guys are going to be segmented. So, 
I know, I know. Go by their characteristics. Right? This is why I give them to you. All right, so they are freshwater, they're marine, they're, they live in the soil. These guys are pretty much, out, I mean, they're worms. Like, think of an earthworm, Um This one is a marine polychaetes right here, and you can definitely tell because of the segmentation. This guy also has what's called parapodia, and I'm getting, I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but parapodia, para means on the, like, on the outside, um, and podia means feet, so they're kind of like paired feet on the outside. Um, let's see, they have extremely well-developed nervous system and a brain. What? Yes, we've gotten to a brain finally. Um, they are segmented both internally and externally, so that's the, why they are the segmented worms, because they are severely segmented. Um, they have a closed circulatory system, just like us, so they're not doing this simple diffusion nonsense like the flukes. What these guys are doing is actual digestion, and then circulating said digested nutrients wherever they need to go via veins and arteries. Okay, that's a closed digestive system. Sorry, a closed circulatory system. The same thing we have. Okay, so we have a little heart and we have blood and it circulates all around our body and that's a closed circulatory system, right? Same thing with these little guys. Uh, they are bilateral in symmetry. Remember I told you most of the things from now on are gonna be. Um, these guys do have what's called setae. Setae are bristles they come off each parapodia. So remember the parapodia are the paired legs? Well, the very ends of them are going to be setae. And these are the bristles. Not all of these segmented worms are going to have the bristles. Okay, just what's called the class polychaeta, and that's what we're going to look at right now. All right, so these are the segments that you can see right here off of each one of those, uh, those little tiny feet looking things. Those are the parapodia. If we look on the cross section, basically we've just taken a and we look at the cross section on the inside here, we can see we have blood vessels going on. We can see that we have a nerve cord. We're getting to more complicated things, you know, that we find in us. We have a digestive system. This is the intestine right here. Um, this is a close up of the parapodia or the little leg. And off the outside right here, if you are a polychaeta, you have the bristles as well, the setae. Right, setae. Um, up towards the face, we have tiny little eyes. Yes, actual eyes. We have this head region right here. We have the mouth region. Fun fact about these guys, these guys have a mouth that can actually protrude forward and grab stuff. So this is known as the pharynx right here. So when it's pulled back inside, you can't see it. But then all he has to do is extend that pharynx out and he can actually reach out, grab stuff and pull it back towards the mouth with the help of his little jaws and his little teeth right there. Does this, yeah, would you like to meet one of these if it was actually the size of you? No, no, thank you. Thank goodness we are bigger than all of these psychopathic, murderous things. Because remember, these guys, these Annelida, first hunters. First actual, like, I'm going to come get you hunters, and they're voracious. They're crazy. All right, so now the only one of the worms we're actually going to be talking about the class, we have the phylum Annelida, the class Polypita. Okay? And these guys have the parapodia on the outside used for the walking. They have the setae and the bristles. They also, this little thing that I showed you guys right here, that pharynx coming out, this is known as a proboscis. So the proboscis will actually come out, mm -hmm. grab stuff, and then pull it towards. So again, who is a proboscis? Analyta, specifically analyta, phylum analyta class polychaetic, because there are other classes. We're not gonna be mentioning those classes. I'm trying to keep it as simple as, as I can for you guys. But these are kind of a big one in the marine environment, so we have to learn about them. Um, let's see. Oh, some of them build calcareous tubes. So if you've ever seen the tube worms, especially like the deep sea ones, the hydrothermal vents, these huge tube worms are like three or four feet long of worm. And they're built, they basically build these little tubes, and then they, that's what they use for protection. Um, so again, those deep sea worms, those tube worms, all going to be the glass um, polychaeta under the phylum animal. Okay, so again, this is just another example, a uh, couple examples of the class Polychaeta. Um, this is a fun one. This is the sea mouse. I love this guy. Um, he doesn't look like anything. Like, he looks like a sea mouse. He is covered in this like dirt because he lives in like muddy bottoms, things like estuaries and stuff like that. But if you actually look at his setae, they're like iridescent, kind of like green, yellow, a little tinge of blue. They're gorgeous. Gorgeous. Of course, he hides them under all this muck, but normally if you're actually like to clean them off, gorgeous little sea tag. Really, really cool. This is what he looks like from underneath. 
So at first glance, you look at this and you're like, I don't know, is it a mammal? Is it a, is it a, I don't know, a mollusk? I don't, it's like furry. Um, it's actually a worm. So this is a tricky one, the sea mouse, right? That sometimes I like to give you guys on the test. Okay, and if we look underneath, you can actually see his segmentation and the actual setae on the outside, the parapodia with the setae, making him very clearly a class polychaetae. Uh, this is that proboscis, again, that gets extended right here. So basically, when you tuck it back, his face kind of looks like this. When you extend it forward, that's actually what that is. Again, absolutely terrifying because you've got these little... Yeah. God, we can't get eaten by these guys. All right. Oh, I, I lied. Uh, there are two classes that we're going to be talking about for the um, Analyta. The other one is class Hyrundia. This is the uh, leeches. So these guys are your leeches. Now these guys aren't super segmented, but they are still segmented because they are under the phylum Analyta. Um, they are hermaphroditic, so remember boy parts and girl parts at the same time. They are parasitic. That shouldn't shock you guys. They're leeches. Um, although some leeches are predatory and will actually just come hunt you down. <sighs> uh, these guys have two suckers. You're like, wait, leeches only have one sucker. They actually have two. One, the one you're probably thinking of is the one that they're feeding off of you, right? That's the one they're grabbing. They're pretty much sucking your blood. But the other one is down here at their back end, and that's to basically hold them on. Okay, so they're kind of securing themselves with here as they feed off of you here. Because imagine you're sinking your teeth into something and someone's kind of pulling your tail. You're just going to fall right off. Okay, so that's what you want to do. Uh, a lot of the times leeches will also kind of have some kind of anesthetic so that you don't feel them physically eating off of you. And that's why you look down and you're like, ah, I'm covered in leeches! And you didn't feel it because they actually have this like actual num uh, natural numbing agent so that you can't feel it, so that they can parasitize you and you don't even know how awful. Uh, all right, so we can see lots of segmentations right here. This is the anterior sucker, the back sucker. This is the posterior sucker. Sorry, other way around. Um, um, basically, this is the inside right here. You can see this nice digestive system, this uh, intestines. We've got some ovaries on one side. We've got some testes on the other. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Moving on to our last worm, phylum. This is the phylum Ketanatha. These are the arrowworms. So uh, the arrowworms are the bristle mouth worms. Same kind of thing. So if you hear me say either, they're called the arrowworms because they kind of look like, like you could shoot them out of a bow and arrow, right? They're also called the bristle mouth worms or the bristle jaw worms because they have these kind of little bristles or almost like hair, like things around their mouth. And that's again for the grabbing and the pulling of the food because these guys are voracious and I keep saying that word voracious it basically just means like really hungry that they're just out there killing things and eating things of course a lot of what these things guys are eating are little tiny copepods and they're not going to hurt you because on average an arrowworm is about about that big pretty small uh these guys are solely marine um what else they do have a cuticle this is a kind of clear wrapping around them used for protection so if you were to grab them they're not super squishy they're actually kind of like resilient a little bouncy um, they do have two pairs of fins. It's kind of hard to see in this picture, but this is actually fins on the outside right here as well as a little caudal fin. They have a tail fin. And you're like, wait a minute, this worm can swim? This worm can swim really well. And that's because he's pretty much only going to be found in the water column. You're not really going to find them on the benthic anywhere. You're just going to find them in the water column. So they are constantly swimming with the help of these fins. Um, let's see. Oh, they are considered planktonic. Right? Planktonic just means to float at the mercy of the current. So yes, they can go up and down and they can kind of dart around. But if the whole current is going this way, you're still planktonic. You're still at the mercy of the current. And therefore, they are they are not that great as swimmers. I mean, they're okay, but they're not, you know, super great. Here's what we look like if you turn your head sideways. Um, we can see the head area right here with the mouth. You can see the spines. I'm going to show you a close-up picture of the actual mouth. These are those lateral fins that we were talking about. Right, they're paired fins on either side. And then you have a caudal fin, just like the tail fin of a fish. It's called a caudal fin. So is this little tail fin right here of the bristle mouth worm. This is a terrifying image of a very close up of his face. So those are the bristles that are around his mouth, the bristle mouth worms that are trying to pull you in. Yeah, I would not like to see this very club close if he's not super tiny. Um, but still, terrifyingly shocking. Is that it? Are we done? Did we just cover four phylums? Yes, we did! Um, thank you guys so much for sticking with me once again. My terrible dad jokes, in this case, terrible worm jokes. 
Uh, remember to, to check the schedule and kind of keep up on, on the phylums. I know in this particular video I meshed a bunch together, but that's not always going to be the case. So just make sure that you guys are actually watching um, all of the videos that you're supposed to be covering for that week. And um, remember your first test on invertebrates that's coming up. So make sure that you guys study, study, study. Do not try to cram this stuff. This test, this next invertebrate test is pretty hard. So make sure there's a lot of stuff we're covering. So make sure that you guys pay attention to that. Um, pay attention to any quizzes, homeworks, due dates, anything like that. Keep up with your labs. You guys have been doing a really, really great job with that. Um, other than that, I have nothing else for you guys except for, you know, thank you again for joining me this week, and I appreciate everything. And if you guys have any questions, go ahead and email me. All right, take care, and I'll see you guys next week.